Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the September regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. We're going to begin our meeting with the superintendent's report. And the first item is comments by high school representatives. I, I don't see any here. Mike, Mike, do we have high school representatives this year? Oh, homework. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Just as well. Just as well. I'd, I'd like to make a quick report. Am I on here? I'd like to make a quick report on the opening of the school. And I want to say that it was extremely smooth. I want to compliment the administrators for the kind of preparation they made. As an indication of uh, how smooth the operation was, and I was in every school the first day, one administrator was observing classes for evaluation the first day of school. Now, um, I think the kind of expenditures that we come up with to allow the kind of preparation is certainly worth it because no child did not start school immediately with a full schedule, put into the right groups, and school starts immediately. And I think there's a big payoff there. And as you know, at the end of the year, we ask the administrators to give us a report on their schools. And so that the public, now that we're on television, can compare that, I've asked them to give us a sort of a, no more than a five minute opening remarks. And they can close those remarks in May. Now, last May, they didn't adhere to the five minute rule. Uh, so we're gonna ask them to try to do that this evening. Let's hear from the high school principal first who generally is the longest speaker. <laughs> I'll have to ask, excuse me, is this where the microphone should be to use on the podium over there? The microphone and the podium is... The microphone's not working. The only microphone working is up one in the middle. They haven't set up the mics yet. Oh, I see. Does that mean he can stand anywhere? All right. Can I stand um, here? No. No, I, I think you have to go to the podium. <laughs> This over here. The microphone doesn't work. Okay. Um, to the be to begin with, we had a very uh, smooth, a very uh, um, I don't know, successful opening of school. Things went things went very well. Uh, school really opens at the high school um, really in mid-August when, when the athletic program starts gearing up. So by the opening of school, there's been an awful lot that's already been in operation for a couple of weeks. But things went very well. I'd like to review um, new, new faculty and staff at the high school uh, as part of uh, what it took to uh, start school. A lot of the work over the summer really had to do with uh, staffing the building. Uh, we have seven new faculty at the high school. Some of these people may not, uh, may be up for appointment later at this meeting, and I don't mean to preempt that. Assuming that uh, you all see fit to, uh, to nominate some of these people who are before you later in this meeting. Uh, the seven new faculty at the high school are Tony Baffa, in instrumental music, uh, Ray Cooper, who's social studies in English, Jean DeShulo, who's our new French teacher, Lucille Emery, uh, librarian, Wanda Garland, chemistry, Tor Nielsen, physical education, and Kathy Perez, uh, reading and writing lab. We have two new teacher assistants, uh, Patricia Fagan, who's uh, in the reading and writing lab also, and Denise Langdon, who is our career ladder teaching assistant. We have three new aides uh, at the high school. Uh, Susan Coffey, who's the principal secretary. Jean Harmon, who's the assistant principal secretary. And Kristen Tripp, who's library aide. Also, um, some of the new appointments for co-curricular positions. Uh, Tor Nielsen is a new varsity soccer coach. G 
Gail Nappy is our new assistant cross country coach. Uh, Terry Garmy is helping us with extemporaneous speech as part of the debate team. Nancy Ziegler is joining us for the first time and is going to uh, help us with Lincoln Douglas debate. And Betsy Wiley is joining with uh, Peter Horton to be advisors for the literary magazine. We started the year with uh, two faculty who were absent, uh, both uh, recuperating from back surgery. Eric Krantz is now back with us, but Cliff McWinney is out and will be out probably at least through this month and more likely another month too. I, I, I'm not sure. Cliff isn't going to get his next report from his doctors till the end of this month. And um, I would very much like to thank uh, Goodwin Hannaford and Jim Ray who have really extended themselves to cover Cliff's classes, get, get Cliff's classes uh, in operation right from the first day of school despite Cliff's absence. We've also been very fortunate to be able to hire as a long-term substitute a, uh, a USM industrial technology student who comes very highly recommended from Dr. Nene at USM, comes in with some expertise in industrial technology and particularly in mechanical drawing, which is one of the classes that he's helping cover for Cliff. Uh, his name is Scott Foster. When Cliff returns, Scott will probably stay on with us and do his student teaching internship uh, with Cliff when Cliff returns. So we're very lucky to find somebody with some expertise coming in in industrial technology. I'd also like to mention we have a number of uh, teaching interns in the building starting the year. Michael LeClaire is working with uh, Andrea Kerr uh, in our health program. And uh, Gary Vines is working with Sharon Merrill in the guidance office as a guidance intern. We've also started the year, you know, we're part of the uh, uh, teachers for secondary school program at USM and they've changed the structure of their program. They've started by putting their USM interns right in a school for the, right in a school for the first two weeks or one week of school so the interns can really see the way a school begins operating and we've had, I guess it's, it is two weeks, we've had five uh, uh, TSSP interns from USM who have been shadowing various teachers uh, th throughout the opening of school. Our enrollment uh, is 521 students, which is really pretty remarkable because this is the year that the first of the very small classes has reached the high school. Our freshman class is 100. We were looking at a projected decline in enrollment of about 30 kids this year, and our enrollment uh, from one year ago is down nine students. We're only nine students less than last September at 521. Of these 521 students, uh, we're welcoming uh, 26 uh, new students uh, uh, to Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, and in addition to these 26 new students, and in addition to our 100 new ninth graders, uh, we have this year at the high school 14 homestay students from three different countries, Mexico, Spain, and Yugoslavia. One of the, uh, um, as I said, our, our athletic program has really been op in operation now for almost a month. And uh, we are operating this year with a new athletic director, Keith Weatherby, who's, uh, uh, I would like to congratulate also for how wonderfully the athletic program has, has started this year. We have a total of uh, 200 students at the high school who are out for uh, fall sports. That's a larger number than we've ever had before in a fall season. Uh, the program is going well. Uh, I think we've seen a lot of uh, uh, good coaching, a lot of good sportsmanship. I'm, I'm really delighted with the way it's functioning. On top of that, uh, our students are 
doing very well competitively. In fact, so well that I want to brag about them a little bit. Um, just to tell you how well they've started. Uh, girls soccer right now, the varsity is four and one and the JV is three and one. Boys soccer, uh, the varsity is four zero oh, and one. The JV is five and zero, oh, and the freshmen are one and zero. Oh. Uh, field hockey, the varsity is three and one, and the JV is three and zero. Oh. Uh, golf is zero oh and one, zero <laughs> oh and two, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, cross country. The boys came in uh, second out of ten schools in the Ranger Relays uh, last Saturday at Greeley. And um, I'd just like to congratulate uh, our new AD, uh, the coaches, and all the students, all 200 students who are out for, uh, for athletics this fall. They're doing a great job. Thank you. I have a great question. Can you break down all the students in the countries and their Yes, I do. Did you like to hear it? Nine Mexico, four Spain, one Yugoslavia. We did try, and we made some contacts with a, num with a couple of uh, new agencies. And it looked for a while like, uh, I forget which agency it was. Uh, um, it, might have, it might have been the experiment, yeah. It looked like they were going to place somebody with us also, another uh, a Western European, I believe, but, but it fell through. So, so we, we have extended our contacts and we have tried to, to do that. And is this something you will keep on? Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Because that, that's contrary to what the board wanted the program to do. And I understand you tried, but I think uh, if we go another year like this where there isn't some diversification of representation among the exchange students, and I think we we'll to take a look at the program. So, I, I think there are ways that a year for that. Sounds like a great idea. No, We also uh, can report a really smooth opening. I think something really special about being in a K-3 school on the first day of school is how really visually special it is when you have kids showing up in their shiny new shoes and their white sneakers that only look that way one day. <laughs> and, um, and it was really very exciting to have 486 children show up at school on the first day of school. Um, the number I relate that to best in my mind is the year I was principal two years ago. We really averaged about 450 all year. So I really feel like we're up over 30 children from just two years ago. We also welcome six new teachers, three teacher assistants, and one new aide. Um, those teachers are, a couple of whom also, as Michael said, are going to be nominated with you this evening, uh, Mary Ellen Fegan in kindergarten, Linda Friedman in kindergarten, Ted DeMille in first grade, Ren Wilkinson, halftime in first and second grade, Julie Merrill in second grade, David Shields in physical education, Teacher assistants, Lori Bond, our career ladder teacher assistant who will ultimately take over the kindergarten classroom of Mrs. Stressinger. Uh, Daria McGillicuddy in our behavioral resource room. And Pam DeBlois in our composite resource room. And then we have aide Debbie Ward who's helping us in the cafeteria and then somewhat in the office as well. I would say that the biggest development um, since we met together in August is, was uh, Daryl's and my decision to go ahead and open one more session of kindergarten. Uh, if you'll recall that meeting in August, we agreed to try to stay with maximum class sizes of 16. And within a week, we really were there, given some shifts that had occurred. Um, the night before we decided, I had spent two hours reanalyzing lists and had invited Charlie Freeman in to meet with me to try to shift some of the morning students to the afternoon, rerouting buses like crazy, and even then would have open school just about at maximum in every single session. 
the thing that, that Daryl and I really paid attention to were a couple of factors. Uh, one was, no matter how carefully we tried to balance placement two weeks before school opened, changes always happen as letters go out and parents realize they forgot to call us about a babysitter change or something that would change location, which in fact did happen, and we would have had no flexibility to deal with that without going over the maximums. And also the fact that last year um, 10 kindergarten ent children entered during the year, which would have thrown our numbers off promptly. We wanted very much for our placement letters, which we'd been holding up to, able, to be able to be sustained without calling people on September 5th with a change for their kindergartner, or even worse, to in November have to break into another session. So upon conference with Daryl, we did decide to add a morning session. And given that, um, we were able to quickly hire a very competent lady, Linda Friedman, who joined us literally two weeks before school opened. I know you questioned me about space, that was an issue, but um, with her phenomenal hard work and the assistance of some other teachers, we were able to redesign the music room, and if you look in it now, it will look like a kindergarten. Um, we, however, were able to incorporate the, the risers that Judy Pages use, uses for her music instruction right into the flow of the classroom and left the piano there also. So in the afternoons, when there is not kindergarten in that room, Judy is able to continue her program with a classroom base. Um, the rest of the children in music are serviced in their classrooms. Um, when the kindergarten switch in January, Judy will serve then the other half of the children in a classroom-based program, and this was very important to her for her hands-on experiences with instruments, which she simply can't lug from room to room. So we did the very best we could, and it seems to be working out very well. Given that move, um, I can report class size averages to you of 14 in kindergarten, 20 in first grade at seven sessions, 20 in second grade at six sessions, and 22 in third grade at five sessions. Um, our feedback from teachers around the opening that it was very excellent. They felt things were very much in control and being handled well. I give a lot of credit to Mary Ann Brown, who returned as our administrative assistant. And when Michael talks about the year really starting mid-August, we really feel like we never quit. <laughs> the summer just sort of blurred by. And with the administrative change and all of our staffing needs, we had a very busy summer. Um, but it paid off for us to have everything ready to go that first day. So I guess in closing, I'd just say we're really looking forward to meeting all of our parents at Open House and would really uh, love to see you come by and see some of the changes we've made in the building, too. Thank Questions? Okay. I'd like to report, Madam Chairman, for uh, Stephen Barber, who uh, has a meeting at the public schools. I'm reading the statement. Our school year began quite smoothly, almost as if summer vacation never occurred. Our enrollment is up from last year due to new students entering Cape Elizabeth, a larger fourth grade entering class replacing a smaller departing eighth grade. Enrollment is 533. 33 of the students new to Cape are students that come from as close to South Portland, as far away as Long Beach, California. Colorado, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, and Ohio are also represented. We've started the year with three new faculty members that we will discuss a little later, and all of the coaching positions are filled, and the seventh and eighth grade students interested in interscholastic sport can participate in any of the traditionally offered programs. So I'm pleased to say that our table of organization is complete and uh, our coaching positions are filled, and it's been a very smooth opening from my point of view. Excellent. I have to say the hard work in the summer does pay off. I know there was a lot of hiring to do this summer, a lot of preparation work, and we thank you for that. Are there any other questions on any of the reports? No? All right, the next item is the report on the playground completion. As you know, we've discussed this for almost a year and a half now, and Susan Weatherby is here to probably make the final report on the playground. And if you've seen both structures, particularly with the young people on them, it's a sight to see. Susan? Thanks to the efforts of, of many volunteers, phase two was 
constructed on August 8th and 9th. And since that time, and prior to the first day of school, the edging around the playscape was constructed and some regrading and reseeding of, of the surface has been done. And as of today, we received the new mats that will be placed at the bottom of the slides to prevent the deterioration of the P-stone in, in an effort to keep the risk of injury um, low. We are pre presently waiting for the planting of the trees, which is scheduled for later this week. And we have received a design from Playgrounds Incorporated that will make the first and second grade play structure handicapped accessible. Um, we will be seeking estimates from local contractors um, to construct the necessary ramps. Um, with the exception of the overlay of the asphalt, which will be done in conjunction with the handicapped repaving, we anticipate phase two um, to be completed in the next couple of weeks. They sure are. Even the middle school children have enjoyed the um, the cable rides. And, um, some conversation about <laughs> let's go over to the playground. I think that's wonderful. Great. Thank you. Thank you. This is only to notify the board. The letter is in the, your packet. The five-year progress report for the high school has been accepted. And I'd like to point out that the commission was extremely pleased with the development of the K-12 computer education program, the integrated high-tech curriculum, which involves math and science and industrial arts. And uh, we received uh, a lot of acclaim on that, as we know, last year and our life skills and transitional program for handicap and low mobility students. So we're good for five years, which probably will be the time the high school will be evaluated again. 1992. Seems like not so long ago that they were here. And you have the time to do it again. Sounds exhausting, but I know it's a good process to go through. Um, our next item concerns the 14th Annual Main School Management Association Fall Conference, which is held in Augusta. And this is uh, an annual on October 22nd and 23rd. The programs are varied from uh, clinics on mediation, staff development, superintendent board roles, and self-evaluation, and just a host of things. And uh, I bring your attention, for those of you who want to attend, should indicate your preference so that we can register this, uh, these, or your programs as soon as possible. And if you would uh, tell Betty, we will get that out tomorrow or the next day. Uh -huh. I would request, I would be interested in attending, but I would like to see the complete agenda to be able to choose, and I think the letter says that we and let them know by October 13th. So when we have a complete agenda, I would have. Right. Cool. They haven't sent it out yet, I don't think. You haven't. Good, Bob. Well, I'll make sure you get a copy. Um, let's see. The next item is the presentation of the Science Research Association's Associates Achievement Test Report. I'd just like to say two things. Uh, tonight you'll hear this, and you've heard this uh, yearly. Uh, next month, I'd like a presentation by the administrators on the fourth grade assessment and the eleventh grade assessment. And I want to just uh, remind you that one of our goals was uh, a restudy of our complete testing program uh, throughout the year, so we could bring to you uh, a new program starting next year. 
That probably will be delivered sometime in May. Uh, Mr. Kramer is here to uh, make a uh, short presentation. Also, the report is in your background. This year, the SRA tests were administered to grades 5, 6, and 7 in middle school. Grades 4 and 8 did not take the test because they are required to participate in the main assessment testing program. And each testing program really takes the biggest chunk of the education time of the whole week. And we talked before about losing two weeks is not, does not uh, make it worth the time to bother to do two sets of testing in one year because of the educational uh, time that is lost here. What I have done for you is to present two or three pages of, of a report that I'm assuming that you folks have read, so I won't go over that. I would like to go through some of the charts that I provided for you. Figure one that you have shows that the composite chief test results and the composite was a combination score of the English, the math, and the language arts is very high for all three grades, five, six, and seven. The reading is equally high, the math is very high, and the language arts drops down just a little bit, but still remains very high. The um, social studies is extremely high, but yet the early grades, reference material scores, and the science scores for all three grades are, are high, but relatively low to the other scores there. If you go on to figure two, I reproduced figure two for the audience here. Uh, this puts in graph form what the chart says. The red line here shows the achievement test scores for the three grades and 84 in grade five, 83 in grade six, and 85 in grade seven. The dotted blue line here shows the educational ability score for the grades at 74 for grade five, 84 for grade six, and grade seven is 86. Those are all national percentile scores. One thing that you folks on the board do not have on this graph is something that I added today, and that is the state user average scores for the state. At, at all three grade levels, the composite achievement test for the state average is at the 64th percentile. This graph actually represents the top half of what would be the whole graph. The bottom line here at 50 would be an average score, so that our students come out about 84 to 86 percentile points higher than the average nationally, about 20 points higher than the state of Maine schools who use the SRA test. Many years ago, when we adopted the SRA testing plan, one of the reasons that we picked this particular testing plan is because it allowed us to take a look at the growth, the academic growth of students as measured by tests over a 10 year period. We've now achieved, reached the point where we have only tested three grades this year. But what you were able to see is the growth of at least two of those grade levels. In order to get the growth of two grades, you see you have to test three because you can't get um, three comparisons from one year to the next with just three uh, testings. You always end up with one comparison less than the number of grades you test. Um, the X here, well, first of all, let me explain that on this graph, the red line in the middle is the average. In, in the report that you folks have, that middle line is marked the mean. The mean is in red here. You can see that our students score approximately one standard deviation above the average. 
which is again about the 82nd or 83rd percentile. Grade six students, uh, we took a look at the scores last year and then a look at the scores the following spring, and they actually gained more than the kids across the country who were tested and tested out at that level. Again, one of the reasons that this particular test was adopted is that you can actually look at the growth of our students compared to the growth of other students across the country at the same achievement level. Um, <clears throat> as our students went from the seventh grade to the eighth grade, they went from a point somewhat above one standard deviation above the mean and kept that same rate of growth. So what that is saying that our seventh graders last year um, came in at a very high level, about the 83rd or 80, 83rd to 85th percentile, and kept that same uh, rate of growth. Following that is uh, a summary of the uh, amount of growth that the students made at all three grade levels. Uh, the students did better than the students did the prior year. That is somewhat different from last year, where each one of the grade levels declined a point or two. This year, every grade increased their scores. I have listed uh, three or four summary statements and some recommendations. And if you folks have any questions, I'd be happy to address those. Thank you very much. I just, wow, I wonder um, if you yourself have any feeling where we should go with all this or with the testing or if you can forecast what a year of study might what? possibly bring. What I think should happen is that we should look beyond just a, I think that we need to look at the different kind of testing programs that are available to speak with the representatives who market those particular programs and pick the one that suits Kate Elizabeth the best. And most schools stop there and we have in the past. I think that we should go one step further. That's a very important step as far as I'm concerned. And that is to list the other kinds of criteria and different kinds of criteria that uh, citizens, people who may be moving to the community, and other people may want to look at, certainly things that we probably should look at, uh, sex things as achievements that our students have made in non-academic areas, the sports area, as well as some of the academically oriented extracurricular activities, uh, the debate, and then look at our college placement uh, record. And a number of different factors, I just point out some of those as possible kinds of criteria that we should look at. I think the committee needs to search out and establish a priority as to what should be used, and then develop a document that's very similar to what Governor Kerner talks about in his report card for each community. I think that that's critical. And what it does is, adds a lot of breadth to your evaluation of the school system and gets you away from just a statistical report that has many pitfalls and shortcomings. It diversity, diversifies, uh, I think, the report to parents and citizens in the community and gives a much broader picture of what the school department is really doing in the school system. And I think that that's, that's a must. If we have a look at a comprehensive on testing and evaluation of the school system. And then the recommendation will be brought soon. Thank you. Did anybody else have any? No, oh, excellent recommendation. Yeah. And uh, thank you for the wonderful charts. <coughs> Good report. It gets better every year, Lyle. You know, it's something to look forward to. Uh, let's see. That is the end of the superintendent's report.
going to move to the regular agenda now and start off with approval of the minutes from the last meeting. Did anybody find anything they needed to correct or revise? Yes, I believe that it would be nice if under the goals and objectives for the following uh, this year that the two that were board started by the board be designated as such because that's how it took place that evening. I see the number 12 and 13. You will show that those were... From the 12 and 13 were designated by the board. <laughs> Added to the original list. <coughs> Is there anything else? Do have anything? Then the minutes are approved as revised. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, our next item is the business manager's report. And as I look around, I don't see a business manager right now. Um, Daryl. I. Uh you have the statistics, and what I would like to do is to make a full report in October uh -huh. uh, when we can see more clearly what the year has been like. I think that's a good suggestion. Um, we have our enrollments. Um, does anybody have any specific questions? Or we can sit with Daryl and wait for our new person to join us. Right. And we would move to item number three, which is the consideration of the superintendent's nomination of new teachers. And you all have. Oh, that, excuse uh, me, on the I summer would, program surplus, did you want to. I would pull that. We will talk about that. Yeah, and, I'm, and I would the, uh, recommend we pull that. We'll pull that and talk about that in October. Can we not initiate that? At right. this time. <coughs> on the. Community services, we will not be doing that at this time. Uh, we're going to discuss the nomination of new teachers, and there is one missing from the list. Right, and, and we'll I'll, go through those. I'd like to pass that one down, Madam Chairman. The first is uh, Linda Friedman, and as you can see, uh, from this point on, we will give you a short. Uh, Vita of the candidates to show you the quality. Julie Merrill, grade two. David Shields, physical education at the Pond Cove School. And Wanda Garland, chemistry at the high school. Uh, you have a veto on each of them. And I want to say that, uh, again, I'm extremely pleased with the quality of the staffing. And uh, in the interviews, I'm quite certain that uh, the career ladder has a certain attraction for quality people in this school system. And I said that last year, and I'm saying it again. Uh, these people uh, seek a school system where a person can develop and be remunerated accordingly. I think I'd like to say that for the record, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, the, the okay, excuse me, Madam Chairman. The fourth one I forgot that I just passed out to you was Claire Ramsbach. And you have her veto. And she will be teaching the halftime grade six. And French and at the middle French school. French at the eighth grade. And there was a fifth. I think Julie Merrill is on our list, who was teaching grade two. Right. Unless I missed you saying that. I heard nope. you say four. There are five total here. Five total. Five total. Do you have any questions? Comments? Some of us were involved in interviews of these people. Found them to be first rate. There's no questions or comments? Or Just that the last candidate when she and I did our student teaching at the same school, and I thought probably would have closed down years ago. Well, she, she's probably the best yeah. one, Priscilla. <laughs> We didn't know that in the interview. We didn't know. We didn't know that. Fruit Street School. <laughs> Fine. Well, if there are no questions, then we need a motion. 
I move we uh, accept the nominations of the superintendent for new uh, faculty. Second. All in favor. Any opposed? Support and nothing. Our next item is the appointment of a school board member to the sabbatical leave committee. As you know, our contract provides for our staff to take sabbatical leaves after they have been with us for seven years. And you have in your packet some information about that, did you? Article 13 is in your information packet, and the applicable parts are 13, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. That should be in your blue. It's the last blue page. The last blue page. Um, Fran Haywood has indicated her interest in serving on this committee, but we can have as many people who, as who are interested, certainly. So I move that Fran Haywood be appointed. And I second it. Any second it? Anyone else have any interest? <coughs> All in favor? All opposed? Four to nothing. Our next item is a concerns a proposal for funding of an alcohol pro program. Um, this is an attempt to have funding for our Quest program at the middle school and for help at other grade levels as well. This is primarily our allocation for substance abuse. Uh, I'd like to say it has to be adopted by the board so that the uh, state board will accept it. It was written this summer. We had parental input from the committee established at the high school with Michael. And uh, while it doesn't constitute a great deal of money, it's still a few dollars. And those districts that do not apply for this money, it'll be pooled. And we, in turn, will turn that around and ask for a good share of what is there that isn't distributed. So uh, I would like to have the board accept this and we'll send it in and we'll be prepared to write another report when we find out how much surplus money there is. Wonderful. Are there questions? As we know, this is in line with one of our goals, the development of a substance abuse, abuse program, K through 12. And this will help us develop that and help the committee. So the, the total amount we're applying for is three thousand six hundred and seventy odd dollars. First year and a like amount in the second year. Questions? Okay. I move that we accept the application for drug free school funds from the state of Maine. <coughs> Second, second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Four to nothing. Any passes? Right. Item number six is consideration of an equivalency di diploma program, which is a real addition to the community services department. All right. The community school department has been working on this for a while, and I'm going to call on whoever's going to give this report. As uh, Gail Nappy, Community Services Director, as is indicated by uh, the dates on the top of your report, we did um, begin this uh, whole approach in March of 87, and um, at this point, we feel it is ready to come before you, hopefully, for your endorsement. And I think I would like to also at this point introduce Cindy Langley Wilbur, who has worked with us um, in terms of the GED program since its inception in, I believe, 1983. And um, she has been the person who did most of the legwork in terms of the statistical gathering um, for the report. And we did collaborate in terms of getting it together for you this evening. Um, so she will be the presenter, Cindy Langley Wilbur. Thank you, Gail. Um, hopefully you've read this. Um, 
my leg work, as Gail said, mostly consisted of talking to a lot of people in town. And I've worked with adult basic education in Portland a little bit on a volunteer basis. And I found through there that we're, there were CAPE residents going there. And enough that it looked like possibly we could use a program here. I've been interest in, in, interested in um, adult education for quite a long time. And I see no reason why people in this town, given all that is offered here, why they should have to go out of town in order to get a high school equivalency diploma. I think there's a lot offered them here. And this is certainly one more thing that should come their way. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have on my research. Sure. I'm amazed by how the state gets their dropouts. So it's I. <laughs> I mean, it makes so no it's sense I. whatsoever to take your eighth grade numbers and take your senior numbers, is that? Mm -hmm. and the That's right. They call dropouts. Well, That's right. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. That's right. Well, that's one thing that they're working on at the uh, last convention that I went to. They're, they're trying to come to terms with a, a good definition of what a dropout is. I think it's a good place to start. But I mean, that's, I mean the children that we have going to private schools, right. they're considered dropouts. And that makes no that's sense right. Whatsoever. That's right. That's right. That's mm right. -hmm. What is the uh, <clears throat> budgetary impact on the school department to initiate this program? And for that, what would be the immediate impact of any, in any uh, study that you've done of the long range impacts of the budget? So, five years down the road, we're going to wake up someone and say, Look, we've had this program for five years, and it costs, it's going to cost us X amount to keep it going. Well, most of the costs will be subsidized by the state. Um, do you have? Page four is the outline. OK. On, um, it's actually page three. Um, the administrative salary is 70% state reimbursed. Um, teacher salaries are 75% state reimbursed. And should we have any? South Portland residents or Westbrook residents come in who want to go through our program, then Cape Elizabeth can claim subsidy for services provided to them. Okay. I don't think the most diplomatic way possible. I also the Go ahead. Uh, and you may not have the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still don't know what it's going to cost us. You say 70% of the administrative salary would be reimbursed. If the administrative salary is $100,000 a year, that's $30,000. The administrative salary is only $30,000 a mm -hmm. year. Well, going, excuse me, going on what I provide for services, um, I'm paid about $12 an hour, and I don't think I've ever put in more than six hours a week in order to administer just the GED part and working with students. I guess rather than take up our time here, I really would like to know, Mr. Superintendent, what the school board is going to have to appropriate at the next, the next budget process to support the program. I think it, okay. if, if, we, if it can be delayed until the next can I, I can I can also help it to answer your question as well. This administrative salary, these are monies that are already accounted for, in fact, in the budget. We have an account for adult education, and Cindy is already accounted for therein. Um, also, the administrative salary is also part of my time administratively, also figures into that. So you see you won't see any appreciable difference or any appreciable change in um, administrative salary as to this program being added. Mm -hmm. more than $1,000 a year or 
this is going to cost 10000 or 15000 or whatever it is, because I think that's the only way we can make an intelligent decision here. Mm -hmm. I would know what it's going to cost. Madam Chairman, I would suggest that uh, we explain in item four for the next board meeting uh, our in-kind contribution. See, what you're talking about is in-kind. We're all ready to spend it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd be more than happy to help. If we delay this until October the 13th, give or take, will that delay the program? Um, well, I... I would not be able to say exactly because if it had been approved this evening, we would have started the training process. I'm not entirely sure exactly how long that process well, would let take. Let me help a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you're saying to me, Mr. Superintendent, uh, that there's no variable cost that the school department would have to bear with respect to this program, that, uh, that the fixed costs are already in the budget because those costs relate to other school activities, and that there is no additional incremental cost to the school department by, by virtue of this program, having this program. Therefore, if we don't have the program, we don't solve it, if we don't save the network, then uh, I don't have a problem with it. But if there's an incremental cost, then I do have a problem, and, 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 and that is, I want to know what the incremental cost is. That's what, what I'm saying, and which I, what I think is not here. The 30 or 25 percent cost that's reflected here is in kind. That means it's already there, and a director will be spending a few moments there. I would suspect that uh, the cost of this program over a five-year period of time would be minimal, and I mean very minimal. I would say five percent of the cost of this program we would bear. I, I. I have no problem with it. I'm not trying to be difficult, but I don't know what 5% of what. That's all. I, 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 my question is no mystery to my question. I simply want, you know, the we, percentages don't answer my question. That's all I'm trying to say. Well, we would, and we would, if there we is no incremental cost at all, if the answer is, Mr. Facius, we have, there, there isn't a nickel more that you're going to spend by having this program or a nickel that you're going to save by not having it, then I don't need to go further than this meeting. What I, would, I don't know the answer to the question. Okay, what I would say to you at this point is that administratively, I would say there would not be any additional cost. But on a per pupil basis where we now have none, and we will in fact have one, two, whatever, you may in fact see additional costs relative to picking up students for the program. an obstacle, but I think I'm obliged to find out what number means. Then I suspect that we would have to do some kind of estimate model. In other words, how many youngsters do you, how many people do you expect to start? We have one on hold right now. One on hold. Mm -hmm. That certainly is going to be the cost. No. Could we, what, do, what do you anticipate we'd have after a semester? After a period of no. Six months. Really I'd say we'd probably have maybe four or maybe a half a dozen. Then I would suggest that in item four we make a model of a half a dozen and outline all of the costs for a half a dozen people and project it over five years and bring it back on October and effectively it will be very minimal and we can go forward. Would that uh, satisfy the board? Yeah, I'm the one that's raising the issue with the satisfied aid. Then, do we all understand what we're going to do? Yeah, well, the program has been planned for in that we do have in our adult education account a GED tutor, okay? And those, that information was in the budget. And instructor salaries that were planned for amounted to $1,240. Okay, so that is, in fact, planned for monies. Okay, so that would not... Attach that to the model, project the cost for five years, come back and tell the board exactly what it's going to cost to continue. All right, one more thing. I'm accustomed to the fact that with community services, uh, they aren't appropriated funds. I mean, it's, it, the programs pay for themselves. Uh, so I want to make it clear that I'm asking how much would have to be appropriated, appropriated by the citizens of the town to do the program 
if it pays for itself, if the, if the students in the program are going to cover all the costs, then I, I have absolutely no concern. I just want to make that clear. And apparently we can't answer that at this point, can we? Well, in effect, I don't believe that the students are going to be asked to pay um, costs for entering into the program. I think that state subsidies certainly pick up a percentage, but um, the school department itself, being our division, to some degree, is going to have to build in the other percentage into the budget. And I realize that you're asking a, almost a, a, pure, a per pupil cost over the next five year span. And that's what the board's asking. Right? If we can build a model to arrive at it, tell them in October. And I think you can too, Daryl. And the other thing is um, look into the nature of the state subsidy because uh, we find now that the state subsidy for Cape Elizabeth and other areas at least is an ever decreasing amount. So I, I just want you to factor that in so when we ask when I ask that question next time, we'll have that Okay, in reference to that, one more point before I leave. Um, considering the State Department of, of Education and the value that they place on this portion of their program, specific adult education related activities, um, they in fact take a, a very strong view on seeing us do in fact far more, spending far more of our time on those activities than what they term the leisure type of adult education courses that, that we in fact do. So in light of their opinions, I would say that irregardless of what comes out in the five-year study um, per pupil cost, that it's very important for us to uh, um, produce a program such as this um, simply because they, they find it extremely important. Okay, so you know where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. generating a federal program that mm -hmm. would do these things. You won't find anybody in town more interested in ed adult education uh, than I am. Mm -hmm. and so you don't have to convince me of it. I'm all for it. Uh, I simply think that whenever we're asked to approve a program around here, we ought to know what it's going to cost because the next meeting somebody else will come in with a program uh, and if we ask them what it's going to cost, they're going to wonder why we didn't ask you why what it's going to cost. I think we have to be consistent. That's all. I'm 100% I'm for what you want to do. God forbid that I would stand up here and say, I'm against adult education. Not against, but I'm also wise to find out what these things cost. Now that's, I just want you to know that you're not looking at an opponent. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd just like to add to that, that that I think this sounds terrific. I agree with Harold that we need to know what it costs, but I, I do remember well when the state came for their evaluation of the program. Uh, I can't remember. Well, it must have been five years ago because we're due up again. <laughs> that was one thing that they couldn't emphasize enough. They really, um, they have these funny graphics. Mm -hmm. and they very strongly want this to have this program. So I'm glad to see you take this initiative. Thank you. Okay. That's misleading at these iterations. This has already started, was budgeted for, and discussed a number of times. I wanted the board to see the dimensions of this study. Uh, certainly, there will be input from the board, and I will hope to uh, schedule at a later time uh, a meeting where the board can meet the uh, survey team. Also, I think they're going to want to talk to the council and get parent input, the administrators, and a host of people. They've spent a full day here looking at all our facilities, our program, and they're running the demography study at the present time. But I wanted to give you a feeling for the dimensions of the study. Dale, can I ask you a question about sure. the, the, 
these people are going to do a study and come back in our facilities, and uh, I have a, a feeling in my stomach so that almost anybody who does a facilities study recommends new facilities, but maybe that's not the case. I, I, would, I would feel better if you tell them that at least one school board member was likely to be around longer than the other school board members uh, <laughs> thinks that uh, thinks that uh, you'll have a hard time politically in this town selling to the taxpayers, uh, along with other educational requirements, a lot of new brick and mortar. I don't think it's going to happen. So if they know that going in, uh, they might be able to focus some of that study time on some things that aren't substantial for brick and mortar. I reported to the committee that uh, how some of the board members felt and have expressed the feeling, and yours was certainly included, because it came through very loud and clear. I also indicated that the board as a whole did not want a pablum study. That they expected something very creative, and the superintendent had joined the board in that. And that if we wanted a pablum study, we could do that in about four weeks. Uh, we want something very sophisticated, and we want several alternative proposals as how this community can move forward. And we gave them a dearth of material and gave them the most recent survey that went to the community. Remember the one that said about what they like about organization, what they said they didn't want to build, and a host of things. I also sent them the latest uh, evaluation of the property in this fair town so that they'd get some feeling for uh, where the homes are, the value of the homes, and maybe they can uh, correlate the value they place on education here. Uh, they have a great deal of material, and I don't know who the team will be. The team hasn't been selected. Or you say correlating the value of the homes to the value they place on education. You mean if you have a high valuation town, then you ought to have a fancy building? No, no, oh, no. Right. You should have a fancy program. See. And then you have to put some kind of a package around the <laughs> function, Mr. Pages. I not, I, well, we can discuss that at another time. <laughs> yeah. We want a good report. Solid. However, one of the things that will be added to, which pleases me, is every bit of maintenance, capital maintenance projects, will be listed with a cost, an engineering study, and a phase to it, which will be very helpful to us to plan, you know, five years to repair all our, our buildings. It's something they need. Right. Repair. Any other comments on the study or questions? Yes? Where is the study? I'm sorry, I don't know when, where we are in progress. They come once. When will the study happen? When will the report be due? Buddy, the study will start uh, any day, they've been here once, so I don't know when they'll come as a team, but it's due February 29th, that's the report. So, six months? Right. More or less. Any, anybody else have any questions? All right, um, I'm going to ask that we just hold off on item number eight because Mrs. Haywood is supposed to be here and wanted very much to be here for the discussion of um, this item and we'll just skip on to number nine and uh, come back to number eight when she gets here. Right. Number nine, this is the second reading of the policy that was presented in June. Uh, the board members have discussed this thoroughly. Uh, we had uh, one or more board members on the committee that uh, developed this plan and I presented for uh, your approval and if it's approved, it'll go into the policy manual and will be implemented this year at the Bond Cove School. Now, this is the policy on promotion, acceleration, and retention. Right. Um, there was some comment from the public at our last meeting on this. I remember several people speaking. And I, I guess I'll ask the board first if you have any comments or changes you'd like to see. Yes. And then I'll open it up. I, don't mind, uh, I have a question. This, this policy on promotion, acceleration, and retention, 
has a lot of uh, language in it. I want to just ask a simple question about what its impact is. Is this policy going to, the adoption of this policy going to uh, result in uh, some impact on the kids that are not getting now? I mean, is, is it going to be something we're going to see that's different yes. in the school as a result of this? Good. Very different. Yeah. All right. Now tell us in layman's language what's going to be different, what we can expect to see over that school, that those schools is going to be different. You can expect in that school that there will be a comprehensive, very thorough procedure when a child is accelerated or retained. And that procedure is pretty much listed here in terms of the factors and the criteria that the teachers and the group of people will look at. And from this day forward, these decisions will be made up by a group of people looking at all of these factors. And the process, as you can see, which probably should be called regulations, is in the back. Now, heretofore, the process was never on paper, and we're not certain, you know, to the, what extent people really went to to do all this. But now we would know exactly how many people involved, what they looked at, what they recorded. It's a uh, all right. So it was. It was. The, dis the decisions with respect to acceleration, promotion, and retention were more ad hoc previously. I think that's fair. Yes. I think the committee, and Mrs. Hare was on the committee, I think the committee would feel that way. <coughs> Absolutely. Uh, one thing that I really felt good about this was that we were saying for the first time, here are some definite steps you're going to look at a child not only from an academic standpoint but also they were looking at it the child maybe in just a developmental way but this way they are going to have to look at the child the family how the family's feeling about <clears throat> attention promotion they have to take in every factor that you could possibly take in about a child and then make a decision with the family over what's going to happen in the placement of the child in the school and that wasn't the no. case before no it wasn't now, I guess the critical thing is, since this affects everybody's kid, that, 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 do we have a process, if we adopt this policy, some procedure for getting it to the parents so that they know what the how these decisions are made, at least by the end of the year when the decisions are made? Right. No, I think, uh, I think I'd rather we do a synopsis of this and send it to the parents. The first letter went out today, and I was looking at the newsletter that went out from Pond Cove. I suspect we'll do a synopsis of this and explain it. Yeah. You know, we won't send them 10 pages. Right, to explain then, it, what, exactly how all these decisions were made and how the parents are involved in it. Right. And also what we'll do is uh, we'll ask them if they really feel they'd like to come in and take a look at this. They can. But they want a copy, they can get it. Also, uh, Harold, at the very first uh, parent-teacher meeting, Part of this policy administrative directive states that this policy will be given to the parent at that parent teacher conference and the decision making model will be go the teacher and the parent will go over this together so that the parent will know what is involved. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just a question on form. On page two where it says decision making procedures and criteria for retention. Then again on page three, at some places in this document you were very careful to always mention acceleration with retention but it is not mentioned at all there is that intentional or or not excuse me where were you decision making procedures and criteria for retention on page two I just wondered why acceleration isn't there as well and yeah. then when you def define the terms for against undecided and I wondered if acceleration doesn't apply to the whole policy or only I think that's an uh, excellent point that it should be a part of that also. And it should be on page three as well. Yes, Mrs. Uh, Powers, would you agree? Yeah. That? I would agree to the extent that the process should be identical, Sharon. Um, as a committee, rather than try to uh, invent the criteria that we wish people to utilize, we actually uh, 
as you see, are referring to a decision-making model that had been developed by Dr. Lieberman, which is truly um, asking us to look at a variety of factors around a retention decision versus an acceleration decision. And, I, and I'm not sure they're always common issues. So I think that uh, what may indeed need to happen is that we further develop criteria around acceleration. And uh, that was unclear to me reading yeah. it because it's, you were so careful to mention both terms in earlier parts and then they got dropped in the subsequent parts. And yeah, I didn't know right. whether it didn't apply or whether it did. It just I think we frankly need to determine um, a set of criteria, but not the set necessarily totally for the acceleration issue. But that won't affect the policy no. that we are voting on tonight. No, I said it was a form question. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I have one one comment just on language, and it's it's on the policy. Um, in the first paragraph, we use the word maximum twice, and I'm sorry I didn't notice this the last time we went over it, and I just thought perhaps the second time instead of maximum, we could use greatest for a little variety. Okay. Harold, you're usually the best on language. Does that make sense to you? Yep. Okay. Yeah, you get that? First paragraph. First paragraph. Was there? I mean, when you say I'm the best on language, you, you mean the most outspoken on language. No, you were very <laughs> precise in your language, and I appreciate that. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to comment or question on the acceleration promotion retention policy? Okay, did anybody come for that tonight? No. Madam Chairman, I would like to make a suggestion yes. that uh, we take this opportunity to uh, write a letter from the board to each member on the committee that spent a whole year mm -hmm. uh, so that people will feel that if they spend their time on committees here, uh, there's an end to it and we can do some very fruitful work. And along with that, sending them a nice tight copy of the new policy. Excellent idea. Be really thanking people is always a way to get them to help us again, too, when we need it. <laughs> That's right. Well, if, if we're done questioning and discussing, I think we're ready for a motion. If you're ready. I guess I see the maximum minimum as important as far as language goes. Oh, using the word maximum twice. You're saying maximum minimum in that last sentence. Why don't you do the greatest in the first okay. sentence? Use the greatest in the first sentence then. We can use maximum twice. That's just that's a very small uh, suggestion on my part. If you think it, the wording is important and you worked on the committee, I'm sure you struggled over every word of this, so there's probably a good reason for it. All right, she says yes, so I guess we're going to have maximum <coughs> twice. Next okay. Five okay. ways. So bow to the person who works so hard. For what? For the words. <laughs> In that case, are we ready to vote on this? I move that we accept the new policy on promotion, acceleration, and retention policy K through B. Second. Second. All in favor? Four to nothing. Policy passes. Um, well, I see Mrs. Haywood is here, so we will go back to. Um, Item number eight, the consideration of a policy on private student tutoring. Gerald, I will ask you to speak. Maybe. I'll be happy to. For a little history, several years ago, the school board had a policy on private student tutoring during the day. Uh, parents wanted to take the youngsters out for ballet, music lessons, and the like. Last year, the superintendent allowed a special education student to be tutored during the school day, and it raised uh, considerable problems with the staff 
in the school. I think it would be in our best interest that all tutoring, whether it be academic or ballet, music lessons, uh, skating, and what have you, <coughs> uh, be done before and after school. And uh, I've spent uh, some time talking to the people in special ed on this, the administrators at Pond Cove School, and the teachers who were involved. So I bring this to your attention this evening. And with you is a draft of a policy that was written that we feel would make good sense. And the, may I read it? Yes. Major purpose of public education is to meet the educational needs of all the children within the context of the approved school program. Student tutoring conducted by private instructors must not detrimentally affect student progress in the regular or special education curriculum. Such tutoring must take place before or after the normal school day, and any other arrangements must be approved by the principal and superintendent, but shall not interfere with the student's school program. If in the professional judgment of the school personnel the disruption is significant, the request will be denied. Now, this is the first reading of this policy. This it's is not the something we're going to first presentation. Not something we're going to and vote on. And I would say that it's probably for discussion. Yes. Um, we'll open it up to comments from the board. Just passed out. Fran, would you like to speak? I, I would like to speak to this. Uh, when I read the policy, uh, we had got it in our packet. Uh, it seemed to me that there must be something other than just this statement that uh, why wouldn't we allow private student tutoring? We do do a, an awful lot of individualization of programming and I, I was taken aback by the fact that we could imagine that this wouldn't be a good idea. Um, I did a little homework. I did talk to some of the people involved. I'm, I'm sorry to say that I I really feel there's um, some vindictiveness to the bringing forth of this policy. I, it, it seems to be aimed at a particular situation last year, a family that was not uh, pleased or satisfied with the progress that a child of theirs had made after quite intensive special education work and decided to hire their own tutor and have the child tutored during the academic day rather than having a third grader tutored for an hour after school. I think those of us who would know uh, a seven, eight year old child would think that an hour of tutoring during the day would, in place of some of the program, programming that didn't seem to be helping the child to make satisfactory progress, it would seem to me that that would be a beneficial thing. When I read this policy, I thought it seems to me that we have forgotten why we exist. The disruption of the scheduling seemed to be the prime concern here, not the education of the child. I did pass out, um, I drafted today a policy which um, is very much different than the policy that you bring forward here and uh, I can read it uh, if you would like. Uh, everybody on the board has a copy of it and, and you do as well, Darrell. I just find it really a problem when we have students, parents who are interested in the progress of their students and in having their students progress educationally well, and while they are waiting for the machines and, and the workings of the wheels to turn so that there can be satisfactory programming put into place, that they wouldn't have the option to intervene and help their child become successful. Apparently this was an, a nine week or 10 week tutoring experience and the child apparently made major gains that hadn't been made in, in the several years beforehand. I don't think we should try to circumvent parents from helping their child to make true educational progress. And, and I don't, first of all, I guess, see the need for the policy in the first place because to me we have lots of individualized programming going on. In this school system, we have voted to allow people to homeschool their children. And so why we wouldn't allow somebody to tutor a child during the normal academic hours would be difficult for me to understand. 
Right. Everybody I, else has a policy, so. Yeah. No, you see, uh, the superintendent felt exactly the way you did. Otherwise, it would not have allowed this. This has never been allowed, mm -hmm. that a child be tutored during the day. Mm -hmm. Now, the experience was horrible. Now, let me tell you some of the things it does. It pits the teacher up against a tutor that we have no authority. And heretofore, our teachers are encouraged to work very cooperatively with tutors. That's what we're here for. Like the learning centers, you are inviting teachers to the learning center to know the tutor far better. Uh, this requires space, and in this case, we even went out of our way and asked the library to furnish the space. Uh, I was more than willing to give this a try. I'm telling you that it, it was not beneficial to the child on the part of a very sharp analysis I was able to do with the teacher. The teacher felt the child spent most of his time looking at his watch, ready to go, and at no time did we have any control over where the child was, and it was very disruptive in terms of the child's program in school. So disruptive that the teacher spent much, a great deal of time with me, indicating that my decision was a bad one, and it didn't benefit the child. And that was her primary concern. And uh, we spent a great deal of time thinking about this. If 50 people wanted to do this, uh, it would raise havoc with the school program. No. I can understand that, but the fact the fact is, I think it's a, usually a very infrequent situation, and I think when the parents feel that, for whatever reason, not that it's somebody's fault, but just a different approach, a different attitude, a di different understanding of the ability of a given child, just a, a new look and a new attempt to make some progress. Apparently, the parents here felt there was a tremendous amount of progress. That's not for me to to t decide, and it certainly isn't for us to discuss a child in right. relation to a policy, but it's just, I, I just don't accept the fact that we, c that we have a way to shut down, basically, our cooperative efforts with the parent, all of us seeking to improve the education of the child. And, and I think that uh, basically the parent really, uh, in terms of individuals, the individualized program, really should have opportunity to do this if the other things are not working. And I think it's, as in any of these things, when we are the people who make a program, who design a program, who deliver the program, and who evaluate the program, I think if a parent has a different point of view, it's just a little difficult for that point of view to get much credence. And I just have a problem with our shutting down this avenue. I think you, the avenue is not shut down in this proposed policy because it says in any other arrangements and the door is there, the open door for other arrangements, but they have to be approved by the principal and superintendent. And I think my own feeling is that teaching is difficult enough, um, but to add that kind of element into the, uh, this, the very short school day as it is, is, is really putting a burden on the administration teachers. Uh, the parents still have that option before school, after school. Or if, you know, they can work it out that it doesn't disrupt the whole school day. You know, that option's there. Let me say it another way, because there, I'm limited as to what I can discuss in terms of personnel. The superintendent all the faith wanted this to work. Mm -hmm. This is dysfunctional. This tears a staff apart for numerous reasons that I would be happy to discuss in executive session. And it places us in a position where we have no control over the party doing the tutoring. So that's about the best I can say at this point. Now, what I, I'd be more than happy to work out some kind of compromise that uh, would certainly benefit the child and attempt a number of things. But I think you should be fully aware that some things, when we use our heart, are dysfunctional. And this happens to be one of them. If it would work successfully, I wouldn't be here with a policy. And I'd be more than happy, Madam Chairman, to discuss this at length before we do 
Another policy. What's the first reading? I mean, and we're I'm not more than happy to anything. examine yours mm -hmm. to see if it meets the criteria. And I'd like to share yours with the special ed department, the administrators at Pond Cove School, all of them. Mm -hmm. Why don't why, that be a good idea? If you and Fran could sit down together and see if there can be some synthesis of ideas here before we come back to the second meeting. Did anybody else have any questions here before I ask the public or comments? Does anybody in the audience want to comment on this policy? Yes. Could you introduce yourself when you start? Thoughts on the idea 
uh, what works for the child? I've, I've heard uh, many comments about what doesn't work for the school system. And I, I agree, those details have to be worked out. However, all the statements made concerning the confusion, the tearing of the staff apart, pitting teacher against tutor, and so forth, are based on one case. And that was this emergency case where I had to step in at the end of a school year and this boy could not function any longer in the special ed room. He was really having very, it was affecting him physically. So I, instead of planning ahead with the school system the way I usually do, setting up a place, uh, making arrangements ahead of time, I, we just put this together very fast and Dr. Pelletier was uh, very generous and accommodating and now we made it work for the child and I say by working this child was uh, well he was uh, it was told to us that he was reading at a 2.1 level and well, after the nine weeks, he was reading uh, fourth grade, third and fourth grade novels, you know, inch thick novels, Hardy Boys, uh, anything a third and fourth grader at an average or above average level of reading. Now, I use this just to say, not to say um, to my own form, but this worked for this boy in this kind of evidence has to be looked at. Um, there was no testing done by the school department. So I only stress this case because all the, all the uh, arguments for this proposal, which does say that this is detrimental to the child, and it is believed that this is detrimental to the child, um, are suggest that it is detrimental child the proposal does. Uh, I'm standing here saying, based on my experience, it is, it is not detrimental to the child. None of the children that I've worked with has been detrimental. On the contrary, it has provided them <coughs> the opportunity to gain the skills to be able to read and write at or near a level. Without this service, they would not have been able to do this. The school board could look at this situation as a situation in which the parent is willing to pay to, to do everything possible for the child to work in the school system to make it work for the child in the school system. A service like this allows one-on-one -on -one attention, which special ed on a daily basis in a public school system cannot afford to do. Parents, I found, after working five years and, and investigating the parents' desire to help the children, um, they, they have quite an intuitive sense about what their children need and, and with or without tests, they know whether the child is reading and writing or not. And I think, again, I want to emphasize, that should be the criteria. Are the children who, who would be involved in such a program, are they, uh, are they truly after you know, given a few months of time, are they really progressing much faster than they ever have? Also, please consider that I think there has to be a distinction made on the kind of student this, this service should be allowed for. Uh, I don't think children going to ballet, and piano, and, and special ed, or well, let's say children who are labeled learning disabled should be placed in the same category. If you had a child with a medical problem, and that medical problem, if it was best for that child to leave to see a doctor at 11 o'clock in the morning, 
because that's what worked for the child. You would have to um, agree that, well, I think everybody would want to see and do everything they could for that child. So there, and, and out of the total population of children in special ed, there are very few who are learning disabled. So it wouldn't, you're not talking huge numbers. In terms of the amount of space it takes, I'll tell you where I do my work. I do my work in closets. I, I do my work in hallways with cardboards around. I do my work in cafeterias. I do my work in my home. It doesn't require any more than the space that I am in right here. A, a four by four foot space works. I don't need walls. I, I work with the children and kids going up and down stairs. It doesn't matter where I work. I've worked in the library. I think when you say, has it been beneficial to the child? Dr. Pelletier, you said that it benef wasn't beneficial to this one child, according to the teacher. Is it fair to make this judgment and pass this proposal based on one child and one teacher's opinion? Uh, the question, there was no control over where the child was. As we said, we set this up the last moment. We ended up in the library, so the child had to walk from the school to the library. This is not uh, anything that I would um, encourage. This was an emergency situation. So that is not really an issue. Uh, if 50 people wanted to do it, it would be havoc. Well, there are not going to be 50 people. I think there should be some stipulation on who could have this uh, private kind of a tutoring. You know, our, our purpose here isn't to challenge what you do. I mean, I, I get the feeling that you're well, going well, to. It's, it's no, just that I'm I find it mind. interesting. Okay. okay. I, I think there, I, I'm trained as a lawyer, and I find that there are various points of view on issues. No, no question. And that superintendent, uh, who I have the highest regard for, has a point of view here, and he said he tried to do this, and he's had difficulty with it. Now, the teacher and the tutor involved is telling at least me okay. what her point of view is, and before we make an ultimate decision on it, I really would like to have as much information from as many different sources as possible. I, I just, if you don't mind. I'd no, 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 sorry. Another uh, point you made, Dr. Pelletier, was that it pits teacher against tutor. The case I had here at Cape Elizabeth was the only situation where the teacher uh, just had a different, uh, a different view of the child than I did. All the other 10 children that I worked with and their teachers, we worked together beautifully at Southport Lynn Mahoney High, Junior High School, at um, Wayne School, at the Holy Cross School where I've had, uh, I had about five or six students. I work with nuns. Um, I, I had no problems, absolutely no problems. So how can we judge this on one case? Now, I think the important point I'd like to make, based on my experience, is that what works for these kids, and it's so important in light of the fact that 20% of our adult population in the United States are illiterate, is illiterate is that what works is to have this work done at, during school time. Before school time is a huge drain on kids who have a hard enough time making it through the school day. After school is even worse. At night, worse. That's why I do my work as much as I can during the school time because it works for the child. This is what I ask you to consider. What do you think would work for the child? Can we afford to let any of them slip by? Especially in light if you just look at the fact that it has worked. <coughs> Basically, one reason it works so well is to have one-on-one -on -one attention on a very regular basis. And this happens 
It's just that the school plan is a perfect setup for that because it, it just kids are used to that routine. Well, let's see if I've covered all the important points. It's an ideal situation for the teacher and the tutor and the student because uh, I can I can talk to the uh, teacher about how the child is doing in the classroom at just odd moments. It doesn't need to be a, long, a lengthy time, and this has worked. And as a matter of fact, it is working right in the school system right now with the same student who uh, all these negative comments seem to be based on. Uh, working very successfully, even though it's just been a week of school. <coughs> Working with the teacher, the administrator found a place for me without any trouble, uh, and it looks like a, a, a very successful year for this boy who would not be reading and writing at this time. So I would ask the school board to consider: Is it your purpose to to uh, protect the system, or is it to just find whatever way? It's going to work to have these learning disabled child, so called learning disabled children learn to read and write as quickly and as effectively as possible. Thank you. Carol, did you have questions? No. no. I, I, I just wanted to hear what she had to say since she was involved in the situation. I thought she had a lot of information. <coughs> Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to make the point that we weren't challenging you, and I, I didn't want it to be a personal kind of thing. That's what my comment revolved on. Was there anyone else who had a comment on the first reading of this policy? I did. Just quickly, Kay and then Priscilla, yes. As you probably know, I have two boys in the school system, both were tutored in the summertime. Um, after first grade, my middle child and my um, oldest child after second grade, they were tutored because even though they're bright, they weren't up to grade level reading. I loved hiring a private tutor. It was a one-on-one -on -one relationship. They did better very quickly. It was a positive experience. Um, the school was not real pleased with me, and we had to fight permission to get the books. Thank you. I would just like to say one thing, because this is a personal issue with me, and uh, I feel very bad that it seemed to be so disruptive. I feel bad because I think part of the disruption was just putting him uh, back into the classroom. And I'll talk about this particular student because I can. Uh, he was out of the classroom for three hours in special services, an hour for lunch and recess, which only put him back into the classroom from one to three. Part of the disruption wasn't so much uh, that he wasn't learning or something else, it was the fact that he was back in the classroom when he had originally been out of the classroom. Uh, but I think the whole thing that is, is not being said here, and I think it's very, very important, and again, uh, I can say this, uh, is that Nobody has really spoken much about academic level, and true, it wasn't tested, and I'm sorry now that it wasn't, because I would have had a lot more black and white to have shown you. But I can vouch that the, the growth is so much, and the reading skills have grown so much, that he is now in, in his fourth grade level at reading, writing is still I'm working on, pretty much a grade level where I was told he was at the two, second grade level at the very end of the third grade. On top of that, um, I been told that if something's not working, uh, that it's the, the job of special services to see why it's not working, to go in and correct it. And I agree with that, that's true. But some things will not change. Staff is still staff, it's the same people. The philosophies are still the same. There are some things that will not change no matter what you come up with. And I was told at the very end of when he was pulled out of special services that I must understand, this was said to me, that he'll never be the reader with the spell. So if that is the philosophy of what they said, that is what's being transmitted to him. That is what he, that is what they thought. I'm not saying anything was bad or good. That is what they basically thought. And the person who was coming to tutor didn't have a prejudged version of him. 
She looked at him as what he was doing now and thought well, she could take him. And she's taken him two grade levels in a matter of 12 weeks or so. I think that also the teacher who don't come back had the same student in first grade. So she had a prejudged notion of him also because she had in first grade and he was struggling also. I feel um, that if something isn't working, it's not always so simple as just saying, well, let's go in and, and change a couple of things and maybe try teaching something else. The school has a lot of students. The, the teachers are taught a certain way. The special service people are taught a certain way. There are certain things that don't change. And some students fall through the cracks. And for those students, they have to have another way. They have to. And one of the biggest reasons for after school or before school, again, is the, uh, why we chose going into the school day was strictly, like uh, Jan said, and makes a lot of sense when you're talking younger children, they don't have the capacity to go from 7 to 5 academically. Because you can take an hour before, an hour after, a traveling time, and you have to do it four or five days a week. It's not like it's a one day a week thing. Now, if it was one day a week, there'd be no question. You could go one day a week longer. When you're talking five days a week, that's a very long day for an eight-year-old or a seven-year-old. Uh, and most children can't do that. Uh, and they don't learn as well, and again, you're slowing it down. When you can achieve a lot in one hour during the school day and make arrangements and work with it, and like she said, at this moment, it's working very well in another situation, and none of these problems have arisen, and I think we just need to leave the avenues open. Thank you. So, uh, oh, there might be some. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there anyone else here? Yeah. This is. My name is Wayne Doerr, and I'm your director of special education, and I stand before you uh, a non-vindictive person. Uh, I don't uh, bring with this policy statement, which I wrote, uh, the history that uh, some of the other folks who have addressed uh, the issue tonight. Uh, what I do bring, though, is uh, my thoughts about this policy and why I wrote it. Um, and I'd just like to share that with you. When I looked at uh, a youngster's IEP, the Individual Education Plan, which came from the Pupil Evaluation Team recommendations, it said that this school system uh, identified this youngster as having a learning disability, a handicap. And uh, then it said that we should uh, provide, or that there was developed, an education plan but then we didn't deliver it. And legally, we're responsible when we identify a child as having a learning problem and then develop an IEP, an education plan for that child. We are responsible for delivering it. Therein uh, was the first difficulty I had with this particular uh, situation. And um, it's my feeling that when we do those two things, identify children and then write a plan for them, uh, we better carry that out. And if we don't, then we're setting the board up for some difficulties, and it was my concern that, that uh, we not do that. Uh, the second thing, from an administrative point of view, was that uh, I understood that we did not have a current written policy which addressed this, and that is exactly uh, why this is before you it is a request to the board uh, in the form of our thoughts and concerns for some administrative policy guideline. Uh, I just, I don't carry with these words uh, any background. It's uh, very open-ended and it is my intention uh, and I know uh, Barbara's because we shared the thoughts on this together to uh, ask you for a policy guidance. Uh, whatever that has uh, in it for compromise is certainly within the uh, consideration we would have. We're simply asking for some guidelines so that we can get on with addressing uh, these kinds of matters, something from the board that provides us the administrative structure for that. Could, could I ask a couple of questions? Right, absolutely. Uh, we're hearing all of this for the first time. Uh, would this, you would agree that, th that this policy which we're being asked to adopt 
if it had been in place last year, would have prohibited this lady from doing what she did with her son, right? I, I don't. I, I, I want him to know. I, 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 yeah. It's not like we might all have a different view. Since he's in charge, his view, his view will be of some small interest anyway. I'd like to think that over time, Mr. Patience, it is greater interest. Uh, in my opinion, this policy would not uh, preclude uh, that youngster from receiving private instruction at all. It, in fact, has, as I know you've noticed, in there, a flexibility clause. Now, if our language is a little faulty, uh, my apologies for that. Uh, what we're asking you, at least what Barbara and I are asking you to do, is to read this, not necessarily adopt it, certainly not tonight. I know you have two reading process, uh, and provide us the benefit of your collective wisdom. Okay. So, so, uh, would she, had this policy been in effect last year, would she have uh, been in a position to effect the solution that she thinks she found for, his son, for her son? That's difficult for me to answer because I just wasn't in the situation last year. No, no, well, just assume that it is, it's this year. She wants to do it. She's come here. Uh, the tutors come here and said that the child is uh, now uh, uh, reading at the fourth grade level. The mother has come here and said, uh, what I hear her saying is, thank God this has happened to my child. Uh, I just happened to strike on the right solution to my child, and this has changed my child's whole academic progress. Okay, that's the mother saying that. I mean, I, it may not have, but if the mother thinks it, I think that's important, all right? Because mothers usually know their children pretty well. Um, so she said that's the case. Now, would she be able to do this very thing given this policy? I, 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 I'm not attacking the policy. I want to know, I'm just looking for answers. I don't yeah. this, you know, feel as though you're attacking yeah. the policy. I, I think your, your question is objective. Um, to me, that policy says that the parents may sit down with the principal and the superintendent to make other arrangements uh, for private instruction. And that allows for those people to come to a, a determination of what ought to be. Okay, now again, and I get it, and I don't want to go on this because we've got a lot of other things to do, but if I was the mother, I would be sitting in my chair saying, well, what other arrangements can I make? The only, I, I guess the other arrangements are before school or after school. I think that's the other arrangement we're talking about, is it? Isn't it? No. No? All right. There are a host of arrangements that could be made according to this policy. One, uh, it could be part and parcel of a IEP, which would become our responsibility for paying and hiring the tutor, a tutor, or someone on our staff. Or we could have, with this policy, the superintendent could have said, if you're paying for it, you've got an hour a day. You see, but if this policy were in force last year, and I could have made the same decision, six months later I could have said, this is dysfunctional to disorganization. Now I'm going to suggest ways to make it functional. And anything that we have no control over, that we can't, operate as well, you know that. So uh, I, yeah, think I do know that. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing with you, no, but I must say I, I, I listen to you and, you and what you say is quite rational and persuasive, and then I listen to a mother mm -hmm. come up here and, you know, her kid's only going to pass through once, like everybody else's kid, and uh, nothing could be more important in all the world than uh, whether or not uh, something right happens to this kid. Now, I don't, I must say, listening to all this, I don't have any quarrel with the teachers. On the other hand, I don't think that the, we don't have utopia in this school system. We don't have a school board that's uh, perfect. We don't have a male school board member who's perfect. We don't have a, uh, we don't, we don't have, a, you know, every teacher's not perfect. 
And so, and that's what I heard them saying, is that sometimes there is less than perfection because we are reflective of, of, of human nature. And in such cases, if you're a parent and a mistake, honest mistake may be made. I'm not saying one was made here, but honest mistakes do occur. Do we leave room for the parent to do business with us? To say, here's what's going to save my kid, let me try it. That's all I'm concerned about. I went out to make a decision tonight. I want you to know I'm deeply concerned about that aspect. Okay. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks.
I understand the school's problem in that they do need some control over disruption, etc. But I also am hearing that we need to be more open than this policy leads you to believe we are going to be. If I'm making sense, I don't know. Um, that there has to be built in somewhere here a way a school can say, I'm sorry by the opinion of the director of special ed, the principal, the superintendent, et cetera. This is completely disruptive. What can we do to change this to make it work out for you? But this policy makes it a pretty closed door policy as far as that type of thing. As far as being open to the tutoring or being open to being able to negotiate what type of thing is going to take place for the child. I'm not ask I don't know what I'm asking you to come back with, but something in a different format than what we're seeing tonight. Madam Chairman, I only be more than happy to work on this with uh, the administrators and uh, the director and uh, come back to you for some kind of discussion and your input. And I'll also read, allow them to read the input that we already have. Fine. Excellent. Okay. Now, see, may I ask some technical mind. questions, yes. too? Uh, right now, if a parent does not agree with the IEP, they have an appeal process, is that correct, yep. to the state? A lengthy and comprehensive appeal process. Appeal process. So if they did not agree with the IEP saying your child needs tutoring within the school system, then that could be appealed to the state on the state level. But that's a very lengthy, expensive hearing for the parties involved. It yeah. could be. It could be. It okay. could be managed at a mediation level, which is prior to a hearing, okay. or maybe used prior to. Thank you. I just, I would like to just wrap up my uh, input here by saying that I understand that we have a, a very extensive and a very fine, I think it has an excellent reputation uh, to deliver special education services to the students, to our students for whom it is necessary. Nonetheless, when an IEP is developed through the PET process and all these millions of initials, when the educational plan is organized for a child, and it's your job to make sure that it's implemented, the fact remains that while this is happening, the child is either flourishing or not, or somewhere in between, and you could go to Portland tomorrow take a job and ultimately the parent is left with the fallout from whatever we do whether it's good hopefully it will be and that will be a wonderful thing for the child and for the parent then to recognize but if it isn't working either over the short term or it hasn't worked over the long term I just can't understand how we could put ourselves in the position of saying, as in this policy, if the disruption is significant, the request will be denied. I think that the parent ultimately has the responsibility for the education of their child. And even though we have lots of very fine input for it, I don't see that we can take away the last straw that may be available for a parent to try. And uh, certainly, all of us can understand the idea that from seven to five is a long day for a seven and eight year old. Um, I think that the avenue has to be left open and I, I myself could not um, be in favor of any policy that leaves us with the final ability to say no, you may not do this for your child, period. I make the assumption that before that we've done a lot of work and tried to incorporate this, tried to plan it well so that it fits into the day. But the fact is, as Harold mentioned before, People are different. Some people have difficulties in dealing with uh, flexibility. Some people are have requirements for their own personal uh, classrooms that have far, far more rigidity than I think any of us would see in other places or in other classrooms in the same uh, school system. And I, I think that individual differences here um, would vary markedly. And if somebody's unlucky enough to get a teacher that has 
very much of an inflexible nature this or any other time, not just this time, but in any circumstance, I think it would be very, very easy for that teacher and then the principal who would uh, expect it to be in support of their staff. Um, I think it would be very easy for the principal to say, this is disruptive for this teacher and I don't want this happening. And I don't think that that leaves the parent nearly enough um, flexibility to tend to the educational needs of, of their child. And they ultimately have the bottom line responsibility for that in my view. Thank you, Fran. Are there any other comments? We've got a challenge to rewrite this policy, I can see. We'll really break some pencils. Right. <laughs> um, that ends the first reading of the policy on private student tutoring. Um, we're going to finish up with item 10, which is other business. But Madam Chairman, because this is the first meeting, I'm going to request that uh, I be allowed to place a, a four very important items on the agenda that shouldn't take very long. Yes. The first one is uh, what I call the Lahore-Pakistan sister-sister relationship. Last February, I met with the headmaster of the Ashur Lahore American Society School, and we discussed the possibilities of a sister-sister relationship. On that basis, he applied for and received a U.S. grant for a school program. And Headmaster Vincent has received permission from his board of directors to investigate the possibility of investigating the same. This summer, I met with Vincent in Paris, and we discussed the pros and cons and advantages to the school project. As a result, we tentatively agreed to at least investigate the following possibilities, providing the school board okay. First, uh, for those of you in the audience who do not know where Lahore is, it's in the northeast of Pakistan, known as the City of Gardens. It's the cultural education center of that country with many treasures from the past. The city is cosmopolitan and friendly. The Lahore American School is an independent co-educational day school that offers an educational program from nursery through 12th grade. It was fun founded in 1956 to serve the American students overseas, and the Lahore American School has developed into a recognized learning institution. And it's accredited. It presently represents 14 countries. In my discussion with the headmaster, the following are what we would like to do. We'd like to initiate a class pen pal work program, establish and start an art exchange program, and have our theme in the elementary school this year, Asia, and the exchange of art would be in line with our culminating program at the end of the year. There was some enthusiasm on the part of the staff for this. Investigate a teacher or student exchange program. They've asked for some help from us in terms of building specifications for their new high school, and I've uh, worked on that and would be able to supply that very easily. As a result of our correspondence and discussions, I've been invited to Lahore, and I would, if allowed, take the Christmas holidays, at which time I would take my vacation. I deliver the specifications and bring our art at that time. In turn, he would bring his art in February while he recruits people. And uh, he'd be particularly a good resource because he's been an elementary principal in Moscow, Brazil, Manila with me and uh, is now the headmaster. Uh, all in all, I'd very much like to investigate this at no cost to this district. <laughs> and on my vacation time. So <laughs> <laughs> often we can't refuse <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Great idea. Well, I but was, there are some questions. <laughs> <laughs> but not for me. <laughs> I guess I think of it in terms of an American school that for American students, what, where is the exchange? Well, there are 14 countries of students represented. The American school, the American students are a small population. The, uh, the Pakistani students are from the very wealthy class. Uh, 14 countries are represented with other youngsters from around the world. It's truly an international school. 
So if our youngsters would go, we discuss, they have a beautiful two-week field trip through India. And if we had a student exchange, that's the time I'd like to see them go. So they could get in on that field trip. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there are possibilities for something very exciting. Right? And as you know, uh, the Pacific Basin is uh, where the world's going to be, or at least they tell us that. And if you follow the mutual funds, they're approving that. <laughs> so I think we should look We know you follow the mutual funds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Another question. So Daryl, have a good trip. Thank you. Yeah, to the Indian capitalists for the trip to India. Uh, I spent uh, a week uh, one day in Karachi, and I found it very warm. <laughs> I'm sure you'll find Lahore very warm. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, we have a board here that enthusiastically endorses this free project. <laughs> Can I get to the next one, Madam Chairman? Yes. I'm very pleased to uh, announce that uh, I'd like to recommend uh, a new business administrator, controller for the town of Cape Elizabeth. He uh, happens to be from our sister city, Van Duren. Oh, right. <laughs> We're doing our part. <laughs> I don't know if the sister city should steal uh, their administrators. However, this would be a first. He's presently the uh, school business administrator at MSAD 24. Uh, I think uh, he beat some good candidates because he is also an accountant and uh, was very appreciative of his 30% role as the town controller, understood it well. You'll note that he's been on the finance board of that city. Uh, Rotarian, which we would not hold against him. <laughs> uh, and the references, uh, I might add, uh, were superb. We should point out to anybody watching that the reason you say you should know is that you are a Paul Harris fellow, right? There. I uh, didn't want to add that, but I appreciate the board member bringing that to uh, the other board members. Right. I feel that the two board members were on the committee, and I think they, they can speak for themselves. But I think we have a good, hard-working, good find, knowledgeable individual who will start. Yes, this we need a vote, Madam Chairman. And this, yes, he would start in exactly three weeks from tomorrow. Or tonight, if he could resign tonight. That's, that's, that's did you, October, October, second week in October. Second week in October. October 12th, I think it was. It's a holiday. Okay. Did you have anything you wanted to add um, about this gentleman? Is he still employed? Is he still with the? Uh, is yes. he still business administrator there? Yes. But obviously, he's told him he's going to leave because he got a nice letter from the Van Buren District Secondary School, the principal, the principal recommending him. Well, the principal is retired. Oh, okay. living in uh, Ocala, Florida. Ocala. Oh, and, uh, All the references were top drawer. The, the town is also looking forward to his services? Yes, Correct. yes. Uh, the uh, town manager was on the interviews. We discussed it at length and they met uh, together for a certain period of time. Excellent. Well, this uh, this uh, recommendation is unanimous on the part of the committee. Well, I, I, I think his resume is uh, very impressive. I guess the only concern one could have is uh, that uh, there seems to be a move being made in Aroostook County to take over the Cape Elizabeth uh, <laughs> school system. <laughs> and have a superintendent from the county and a business administrator from the county, and we'll just sit back and wait, see who kind of shows up next. And they start speaking French to each other. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll bring uh, some cosmopolitanism. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we um, might conduct one of our meetings in another language. <laughs> Something to look forward to. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, we need a motion. I move that uh, we approve of the superintendent's uh, hiring of uh, Mr. Delano. D. LaBelle as the new business administrator. Is there a second? A second. All in favor? Five to nine. 
Okay. Madam Chairman, the, uh, unfortunately, this is, uh, came from the council last night, and I have to bring it to your attention. The, uh, the council is requesting of the board to re relocate the polling place at the high school beginning with the November 3rd election. And uh, I haven't had an opportunity, I got this at 6 o'clock tonight, to discuss it with the high school principal. Uh, you can see the discussion the town members have had. The, uh, their alternatives were to remain in town hall, which doesn't provide any parking, I believe, to split the town into do two districts, or to remain one district but hold elections at the Cape Elizabeth Middle School or Cape Elizabeth High School gym. Apparently, it's the parking that's the big concern. And they're asking the school board to allow them to relocate the polling places. Because the parking's so, so good. good at the high school. <laughs> 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 that is really ironic. <laughs> there is a parking lot. The disruptions would be no phys ed classes for a day, correct? I don't know. There's no parking in the high school. In the back parking lot. Nobody's going to take park back there to, to get to the gym. That's how they're going to do it. They're going to have signs up directing them back there. But please. Chris, the there are no places out front, then they'll get the idea they have to go around to the back, too. I, I you know, suspect. I, what, one thing that occurs to me, I, I can't imagine that it ha didn't occur to the people that were studying this and brought forth this request, but for older people who can park and only have a few steps to come into the polling place and the length of time, the length of distance, the distance that they have to walk to get to the gym it is just a very, very markedly increased distance. And I would think that for people for whom it is difficult to get around, older people especially, in icy weather and what have you, I, I really think that's kind of difficult. Well, with all due respect, though, Francis, I don't think that's our job. No, they, but that's they, they I'm surprised that, that they had a committee to look up. at it. And I think I what we it. have to decide is whether it's disruptive to the school. It's amazing. I mean, whether whether this could be done, unless it causes big problems at the high school, it's their school too. Mm -hmm. Michael, do you want to speak to this? Are you as surprised as we are right now? Yeah. Mm. It, 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 yeah, this, yeah. We received this this evening. Yeah. Do you need to make a decision on this tonight? Is this something they need tonight, or can they wait till yeah, October? They, they, need, next? they need. They explained it to me. They need it so they can set up their uh, parking signs, their voting signs. They have a lot of work to get ready for November. Third. They election. really need it, and they they plan to do it in August. In if there are complaints, then then they'll hear about it and either change it back or do something different. I mean, there's no harm in trying. They've been it. studying this for some yeah, time. Yeah, it seemed that they thought of all those things. I'm sure they did. And I guess the, the best alternative is this. And I have never witnessed an election here, so I, I don't know. I can imagine. It's Three good. meetings here is pretty full. They've gotten pretty crowded. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, I mean, I, the only, the only, if they're going to go into the school, you, what you'll have, to, you'd have to do, Mike, is uh, work with them in establishing what entrances will be used, and the police, the people, are going to have to worry about the parking. Uh, so you're going to have people walking in during the school day, uh, probably through that back entrance and maybe through the front entrance to the gym. Those, you know, you just have to control it. With but it seems to me that they don't, there's not enough, the reason they select the school is the town doesn't own another building they except for this one, building. which is inadequate. So Certainly the elementary school has absolutely no room. So, uh, so you're saying you're willing to cancel phys ed classes for a day? Well, that's what this looks like. The well, intent of the polling so, place committee. That disruption. I mean, that, that's disruption. Yeah. And, uh, yes, yeah, I and I think, I think what I want to do is I want to advocate for the continuity of my programs. I, I would rather not have to cancel classes in order to host this. 
It could be more than a day, too. It could sure. be set up time. And it's winter time. It's not like we can be running phys ed classes outside. This is mm -hmm. we have to do it inside. Um, I don't know whether there's some place else we could do it in the school where I can not cancel classes. But we're at least doing that, even given parking, working in the back lot, and. Uh, could we? Could they use half a gym? And, and all the people who set up who want to proselytize voters. I, mean, that, I remember that being a big issue here with all mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. groups coming in and asking voters when they vote. I suppose we could make some use of that for social studies classes, but I really wouldn't. <laughs> I really wouldn't want to see us disrupt classes. Is there any place that we could mark off so we wouldn't have to cancel anything where it's large enough to? Would we have to be minimally this large, wouldn't it? This, yes, this is totally an adequate this size we're small. in right now. It's getting small. Half a gym? <clears throat> Maybe what they ought to do uh, over the next week or so is sit down with you and Michael and so the committee understands what, what we have to do. What you have to do. Give us uh, an opportunity my understanding to. Is that, to my understanding from one of the committee members today was that this has to be in to the state oh. within oh, in the next few days, I believe, I was told. It's true. They asked us to present it tonight, and they gave it to us tonight. So well, why don't you do this? seems to me that uh, you're talking, it has to be in the state because you've got an election on November 7th. So we're talking about one day. Third. 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 Whether or not this becomes a permanent arrangement, is another issue. Uh, so that they can go ahead and do it on November 3rd, I think we ought to approve it just for that date, for that but instruct the superintendent to get his staff to sit down with his committee and discuss, and the police chief and everybody else, and discuss the problems you're going to have and the level of disruption to the high school so that they have an understanding of it before they make a decision on a permanent place. Okay, that gives us one day. So we can look we at it. We're it okay for November you, 3rd. You moved at 72nd, it'll only be November 3rd. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're going to make it legal for them to be nine minutes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah that's right. And then the, then the next one after that, you'll have time you know, in, in next week and so forth. To, the next election is December 3rd, the municipal election. Because that's not very disruptive. Everybody Dozen does people <laughs> showing up to vote on election day. <laughs> <laughs> Who second? All right, so Harold made a motion, and who seconded? I'll second. Priscilla seconded it. Any more discussion? All in favor? Five to nothing. The last item, Madam Chairman, I have yes. is, uh, this is a cafeteria request, and uh, what about the business manager came to me, and uh, there's precedent for this. Uh, Pleased to say the cafeteria has a fund, a cushion of 13000 They need three pieces of equipment that are worn out or unhealthy. A slicer, a mixer, and a sandwich table. It's all written here by the Director of Food Services. I would recommend that we allow them to use the $6,000 to purchase this to get the school lunch program moving along. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Just why uh, were these in the budget and then they were cut? No, so they weren't in the budget because Nancy had recommended Nancy Pennington before she left that we wait to see how much more was added to the portion at the end of the year. And then rather than budgeting it, ask permission to use proceeds or from that portion to purchase the pieces of equipment. I, sometime recently we've had a discussion that uh, maybe you could start looking at your equipment as long-range projects so that it can be plugged into the budget as a, in a five-year plan to say that this year it looks like we're going to need this is the equipment that's going to go, the next year it's going to be this for replacement. So that that can start falling into a five-year plan for us. Right, thank you. If we're lucky to have a food service 
program running in the black instead of the red. That's been a terrific job on your part. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a motion and a second. We need to vote unless anybody has any other any for discussion on that. All right, all in favor? Five to nothing. Thank you. Thank you. On the last item under other business was to set the date of the next meeting. The second Tuesday of October is the 13th. No regular school board meeting will be on the 13th of October. All right. Um, our final item is a consideration of the request by the superintendent to enter executive session for the purpose of discussing matters of collective bargaining and personal matters. So moved. There a second. All in favor? Five to nothing. That ends the regular portion of our meeting. Thank you for attending.